Hi everyone, so we're very lucky to have Alex with us today, who's going to give us a bit of a rundown of what it's like to be diagnosed with a glioblastoma or a GBM, um, as it's Glioblastoma Awareness Day. So we're going to hear from Alex today, his story. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Ellie. Um, so, yeah, I was diagnosed in August of last year when I was living and working in Australia, in Sydney, and very briefly, I guess, my symptoms were I just one day was having a nap on the couch and woke up with this really vivid smell of burning rubber so vivid that I was, I was convinced there was a fire in the house I was actually convinced that my girlfriend had left the straighteners on because that's what it smelled like so I was straight up I was saying Anna Anna there's a fire there's a fire she shouted down like there's not a fire what's you know you're being weird you've just woken up calm down so put it down to just a odd thing when you first wake up but that kept happening and not just when I was waking up it was just happening in the kind of in the day when I was awake so at first just put it down to oh this is funny you know it must be a nasal infection or something and it happened for about a week or so and I thought I might just go into a walk-in centre so went in it was the time where Covid was kicking off in Australia after it had been under control for so long so First things first, the first GP I saw just said COVID test, classic symptom, smell issue. Negative COVID test, went to another GP, said, this is a bit weird, did a few swabs and a few nasal tests, because again, they just thought it was a nasal infection, weird smells. All of that came back negative, and she said, come back in two weeks if you're still having it. And I was still having it. So, I mean, at the time, I thought it was just a funny thing I'd kind of joke to my fiance and say oh having the weird smells again how strange how crazy um but when I went back to the GP after two weeks she said okay I'm gonna have to send you to an ear throat and nose specialist and I did start getting a little bit concerned at that point because I talked to a couple of friends and they had said oh it sounds a bit like you're having auras because one of my friends has epilepsy is a bit like it so I was thinking oh maybe I've got epilepsy or something I don't know and that's so that's what I was kind of expecting but the ear throat and nose specialist said I'm just going to send you for an MRI scan to rule anything crazy out like a brain tumor and went for the scan nine in the morning got a call at 11 in the morning from the specialist and he said the scans come back I can I've had a quick look and I can see that you've got a mass on your brain so I'm really sorry you've got a brain tumor and obviously the panic that goes through you at that stage because not knowing anything about brain tumors you know but <laughs> it's shocking and scary and so and being in a different to... country away totally from yeah 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 and you don't know who to tell you don't know how to react yeah. um and so i luckily i was referred straight to a neurosurgeon and had a Zoom call with him that day where we kind of started talking about it. I'm sorry, I'm trying to make this brief, but it's quite hard. No, um, carry on, carry on. <laughs> so he, he and my immediate thing was, okay, it's a brain tumour. Is that brain cancer? Is it cancerous? And they tried to reassure me without getting into all the details. On my MRI, the tumour is really, they described it as, oh, it's very neat and very clean. And so... They thought it was a low grade tumor and so it reassured me we don't think it's cancer you know don't panic but then having had the surgery and sent the tumor off for testing they kind of brought me back in and said we're really shocked and we're really sorry but it is glioblastoma and it was funny because well not funny but strange in the meeting he said oh now one thing you mustn't do is go off and google glioblastoma and I felt like he was taking me for a bit of a fool because obviously I'd gone in for brain surgery to remove a tumour. Yeah. And, you know, I'm half educated, I'd like to think. I'd obviously done loads of research into different tumour types. Okay, what's a low grade, what's a high grade glioblastoma? And so it was too late when he said it's glioblastoma. I already knew the headline statistics. And so, yeah, it was just that immediate shock, really. And, you know, it took a long time to, to come to terms with it all. And... You started your treatment in Australia, didn't you? So you had, you know, you were very fortunate to have a really good surgery in Australia. You started your treatment um, and then you came over to us in London and you're still going on with your treatment now. Do you want to just maybe just say how you found treatment and, you know, what you're up to now with life now you're back yeah. over in the UK? So, I mean, as weird as it sounds, the bit that was maybe the least 
worst bit was actually the surgery. So the surgery went really well and I recovered quite quickly. I was kind of back in work in five weeks. And I did a half marathon in six weeks. And so, so it couldn't have gone better not yeah. to be braggy about it, but that all went really well. I did have complications after the, that initial six weeks of chemo and radio. I was going so well with it and just fell off a cliff completely. I had a huge seizure on the beach, which was really dangerous because I was, just got out of the water and could have drowned. I just had loads of side effects. So that bit was rough. Um, and then started my 12 month cycle of chemo, which I was started in Australia and then came back to the UK to obviously be closer to family and have a bit of support around me. And so I'm, I'm still in that 12 month, those 12 cycles of chemo. So today was actually the final day of cycle eight. And I mean, you did warn me to be fair that they get worse and kind of it's cumulative through the cycles. And a bit like that first six week one, I was kind of flying at the start of them, was going to the gym on the days I was on it. And I was thinking, oh, you know, I'm tolerating What's this so well. About? Yeah, a little bit, a little <laughs> bit, but it, it is getting really tough now. So I've kind of really bad fatigue, starting to get nausea and a bit of vomiting. So I'm just happy that I'm most of the way there and the end's in sight almost. And you, you are, you know, you feel that they're getting a little bit more difficult, but we mentioned briefly about this headline statistics of glioblastoma and that, you know, it does sound very scary, but you're still living life, Alex, and you're doing lots of things. And is there anything you could maybe tell people about what it's like to live and how you're living your life, how you're going about your day? Yeah, so... I guess just the, the context for me was I'm from the northwest of England from a place called the Wirral and there's a, another glioblastoma patient who now sees himself as a survivor called Dave Bolton and so he's quite famous in the brain cancer world and when I was diagnosed and put something on Facebook so many people said get in touch with Dave look at Dave's profile look at his Instagram and I found it and it was brilliant because it was so positive and inspirational and all about hope and basically saying yeah the statistics are shocking but there are survivors you can you do have hope and that was just something you could really cling on to from the start and so I've tried to tackle it in the same way that Dave did which is there was a great line he had which is well one approach is I could just lie on the couch and wait for the end but I didn't want to do that and that's been my approach really just try and live life as normally as possible touch wood I've been very lucky that I've tolerated things okay and I've worked throughout and tried to keep up with my exercise and my social calendar and things like that and so as far get as I can I'm just, get to Glastonbury yeah I've got, got to Glastonbury <laughs> and I've got a couple of trips away and I'm still going on with the swimming and stuff like that so they're obviously you know I'm not painting it as it, it's all normal there are days where I'm just tied to the couch and I can't get up and you just write those off as you know I need to take this as a, a sick day and a bed day but then when I'm feeling good I try not to dwell and feel sorry for myself and just think well I'm feeling good let's live life as I normally would so whether that's a gym class or playing golf with my mates or going to Glastonbury all of those things and so yeah it's just trying to it, it's a strange one in a way and I sometimes say with my fiance Anna oh it's hard to reconcile because in a way everything's changed you've got this horrible diagnosis everything's so uncertain things could go downhill so quickly but in a way nothing's changed I'm still working I'm starting a new job in September which is kind of a step up in my career you know we're planning for the future we're getting married so life continues on in so many ways but now there's this crazy thing in the background so it, it's mentally it's quite hard to deal with but like I was saying earlier just trying to live in the most normal and kind of positive and just keep moving forward I think you know that's for someone that's young that's been given a huge life-changing thing if you can help other people go through that and have that positive out outlook that's really really great and good for you and you're smashing it so keep it yeah. up yeah, it's funny. I mean, people sometimes say to me, oh, I don't know how you do it. You're so positive and all this stuff. It's not, I don't get up in the morning and look at myself in the bathroom and say, come on, positive thoughts, positive thoughts. It's, I don't know whether it's just the way I am or because I'm into sport and all of that stuff. I just try to live the life that I did previously. But I do think it's really important trying to take those positive stories. So for me, Dave has been that real kind of figure of inspiration and just looking at it and thinking well yes overall the statistics are quite scary but there are survivors and there are people that live long happy healthy positive lives and if they can do it why can't I that's what I'm clinging on to I guess good for you 
Um, so if anyone, I guess, if you'd like, you know, you'd be happy to talk to people or for people to get in touch with you, um, you'd be happy for that. Um, if anyone's looking at the video and had any questions, please get in touch. And thank you so yeah, much, I've, Alex. That's okay. I'm quite open with my story and I've got an open Instagram, so just find me and get in touch, yeah. We can put it at the bottom of the YouTube channel. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Ellie.